It's James Murray with Net News Ledger. We're at the Da Vinci Center, and we're here with Charlotte Robinson, president of the Chamber of Commerce, and we're just getting ready for the All Candidates debate, which you'll be seeing on Net News Ledger, on T-Bay Tell On Demand, and on Shaw TV. Charlotte, this is going to be exciting. It is an exciting day. We're uh, counting down to June 7th, and this is a great opportunity for everyone to hear about the local candidates, what their views are as they're making those uh, selections on Election Day. Now, the Chamber of Commerce has done these debates for years. Uh, the questions are primarily business related? We will have a selection of questions, uh, both business and community issues. We have included one of the media um, outlets in the city, so they'll be also throwing in some questions that are a little more broad. And we know that the, a strong business community also needs a strong community. So, you know, having questions about some of the social things that are happening in the community and what the candidates' views are on that is also very important to the business community. So this is James with Net News Ledger, and we're ready to go. Get the candidates in here and let the fun begin. Okay, we are ready to start. Welcome back to the Thunder Bay Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum. For those of you who are just joining us, whether uh, on the internet or you've just arrived, my name is Charlotte Robinson. I'm the president of the Thunder Bay Chamber of Commerce. Our thanks to our supporting media partners, Acadia Broadcasting and Net News Ledger. And Net News Ledger is web live webcasting the event right now. If you are using social media to share tonight's forum, please use the hashtag Chamber Debate. A reminder of the format, the order of the speaking has been determined by draw, and we will start at the, well, what would be the right of the stage for me to the left of the stage. Uh, questions will be posed to the candidates by the panelists. Each candidate will have 60 seconds for their answer, with the receiving candidate wrapping up with a 30-second rebuttal. The candidates will only be able to speak within the allocated time. A notice card will be shown when 10 seconds remains, and the moderator will cut off, that's me, when the time runs out. Reminder to the candidates that you have pledged to be respectful of each other, to not engage in name calling, to not interrupt each other when speaking, and to follow the direction of the moderator. Also, the audience is asked to remain quiet while candidates are speaking, and of course, we welcome applause after each candidate's response. Our panelists, again, are Rosa Carlino, the 2018 Chair of the Board of the Thunder Bay Chamber of Commerce, and Vic Krasowski, News Director at Acadia Broadcasting. And our candidates for the Thunder Bay Atacocan Riding are Judith Monteith Farrell for the Ontario NDP, Brandon Postuma for the Ontario PC Party, and Bill Morrow for the Liberal Party of Ontario. Let's get started with two-minute opening statements by each candidate, and we will start with Ms. Monteith Farrell. I want to begin by acknowledging we are on the traditional territory of the Ojibwe people of Fort William First Nation. I want to thank the Chamber for the opportunity and hosting this event. For those who don't know me well, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. My best work has been my three children. And, uh, my and caring for my granddaughter, Rosie. But my career, other than that, was started with the federal government, where I was a counselor. And then I started working for the union full-time, the Public Service Alliance of Canada. It had a variety of members, everything from Coast Guard to Grain Commission to the <coughs> airport. And the skills I developed in that job, negotiating, mediation, political action, WSIB, and other things, I really, really feel that I'm able to do the job of an MPP. My biggest role was, ad was advocacy, and I believe the role of an MPP is advocacy. I'm happy to represent the NDP in this writing because they have a fully formed platform that was developed over two years with, consul with consultation with many people in Ontario. It's our political business plan, and it is there, and I believe it will make a, for a better Ontario. It is, we also have a northern plan, uh, a northern platform, and that platform will ensure that northern MPs will look at every piece of legislation to see the impact on 
northern people and northern areas. I look forward to our discussions tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for having me tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. As you know, my name is Brandon Hoshima and I'm your PC candidate for the riding of Thunder Bay Atacokan. And I absolutely love the North. The North is home. We definitely live in a special place here. I was born and raised in Thunder Bay and after high school I went to University of Ottawa. And after that I completed a Bachelor of Education here in Thunder Bay. Being away from Thunder Bay for a few years really made me realize how special this area we call home truly is. I really, really want to be in the North. I want to raise my family here. It's an incredible place to be. It's very unique. I am married to my beautiful wife, beautiful wife Natalie, with whom I have three children. And uh, many of you know me from my business adventures in Kekebeka, technically a teacher by trade, and not waiting to wait five years for a full-time position. I, uh, took to myself to work on business and we do property development, we have rental properties in all areas of the riding. Um, so this is the type of things I know many of you from. Um, but one thing that I have noticed is that everyone has family members that have either moved out west or down south. I have friends I grew up with that don't live here anymore. And I really want my children to go up and grow up in a place uh, in, unique like the North and to be able to stay here. It's really important to me that my children end up staying here and have a good job. And this is one of the reasons why I'm running to be the PC candidate. I want to be a strong voice at Queen's Park and I want to make sure that our unique needs are heard. Like I said to so many people before, when I look around Northwestern Ontario, I see untapped potential everywhere. I see an area that should be the economic engine for the entire province. We live in one of the most beautiful, fun, resource-rich areas of the world with unique cultural heritage that should be a driving force for success. And I really look forward to the opportunity to serve my writing at Queen's Park and Harvard. Thank you. Well, thank you all everyone for being here tonight. And Sharon and the Chamber, thank you uh, for hosting and welcome to the other candidates on the stage. And thank you for being here tonight. My work representing the community started some time ago when I served as six years, uh, for six years, as a councillor in Northwood Ward. I'm proud of that work. I miss that work to some degree, I will tell you, because when you are a member of council, you're an individual, you're not part of a team, and there is some value in that. Uh, being part of a team uh, provides you an opportunity. It's a different opportunity, but at the same time, it can be somewhat restricting on occasion. And I missed the work and was very proud of the work. But while I was there, as a councillor, you learn quickly, even though I had no ambition for higher political office, you learn very quickly that absolutely Queen's Park and not the federal government, that's just my opinion, is the best place you can be if you want to positively impact your community. Over the last 15 years as your MPP, I absolutely believe that I and my colleagues and our government have done that in a very positive way. I'm not an ideologue, I'm a pragmatist. My goal has always been and will continue to be delivering results for the people that I've had the great honor to represent in the riding of Thunder Bay, Atacokan, and I would say on a broader basis, Northern Ontario and all of Ontario as well. The results are everywhere, and I believe that when I go to the doors, people understand the results that we have delivered. We've delivered what people want. They want health care, they want education, they want jobs. And when you look at the jobs front, I think the evidence is indisputable. It's all around us. And one of the greatest parts, and we'll probably have opportunity to talk in more detail about some of the jobs that have come to the community, and I would say at a minimum 1,500, maybe as many as 2,000, depending on how you want to count them up, is the diversification that we have seen in our economy. Often we talk about the need to provide opportunity for long, young people in our community. We've done that. We've diversified. We have a knowledge-based economy now that we did not have before. I'm very proud of it, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the debate this evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. will be from Rosa Carlino and uh, the first response will be from Mr. Postuma of Rosa. Mr. Postuma, we have an aging and shrinking population. Even assuming everyone who is here now and grows up enters, sorry, everyone, even assuming everyone who is here now grows up and enters the workforce, we will still be too few workers supporting too many aging dependents. Increased immigration can help avert this crisis, but the paperwork involved is daunting for most small and medium-sized business people. 
In New Brunswick, the provincial government is supporting local chambers in guiding businesses in the use of existing federal and provincial immigration streams. Here in Thunder Bay, our chamber is involved in a pilot project involving two community matchmakers to help businesses and job seekers connect and to guide them through the paperwork. If successful, would your party support expanding that program and the provincial funds that make it possible across the north? Absolutely yes. We're all for jobs. We're all for expansion in the north. And the answer is absolutely yes. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Mr. Morrow? Canada and North America has an aging population, not just Thunder Bay. It always is a little bit interesting when we tend in Thunder Bay to identify a problem as only ours, as if it doesn't exist in other places. It does. It's very real. In my opening comments, I talked about diversification of the economy. It goes to the very heart of what was described so that we can provide different opportunities for people in the work field that did not exist here before. And there are a list of things that I could rhyme off. The minute does not allow me the time, but hopefully during the debate I will. On the specific question or point about immigration, absolutely, I have to point out, Brandon, that your leader made an interesting comment when it came to immigrants in Canada or refugees taking care of our own, I think was his language. In other words, he wasn't necessarily going to be supporting a particular policy when in fact Northern Ontario communities have been asking for this very thing for a very long time. Of course we would support the work of the Chamber, the communities need it. There's 444 municipalities in Ontario and most of them, most of them need exactly what has been referenced in the question. Thank you, sir. Ms. Monique Carroll. The NDP, your microphone. The NDP absolutely would support such a program. Uh, we are aware of the, of the uh, projects of the Chamber uh, and the work they're doing, developing the labour market and developing people that are utilizing the labour market, uh, like um, women and Indigenous people, and having programs there to support them as well, which are in our platform, and by providing childcare we believe that that will open up opportunities for women to engage in the labor force in a, in a larger uh, manner. But of course we do have an aging population and we do need uh, immigrants and uh, people who are, will, would be Canadian citizens. I'm first generation and uh, I definitely uh, am happy here. Awesome. Thank you. Mr. Postuma, 30 seconds for a rebuttal. I think I'd just add one thing that's important to keep in mind too, and that's that Skills Canada estimates that 40% of new jobs in the next decade are going to be in the skills trade. So it's going to be absolutely imperative that we keep up with this. Right now, only 26% of Ontarians are actually considering a career in the skilled trade industry. Uh, with the growth that I'm predicting in the North, if the PCs are elected, we're definitely going to need that, and we're going to need to work on that together. And people like at the Chamber of Commerce are going to be an important part of that. Thank you. Our next question is uh, going to be posed by Vic Krasowski, and the first response will be for Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow, one of the uh, riding's top uh, private employers is Bombardier, and we've, it's had its delivery problems over the past while that have been well publicized. Have we learned any lessons from what's happened there? Are there rules in place that, that need to be, that can address these issues that the company has faced? Well. Obviously, I'm thrilled that anytime anybody wants to ask me a question about Bombardier, it's one of the greatest success stories, I would say, uh, that the city has experienced. It might be actually in its history when we've ever seen a private sector employer hire 1,000 to 1,200 people, directly related to us as a government having a mass transit policy. It's terrific. Many people in the room will, knew, will know I, I lobbied hard for a 25% Canadian content piece. was instructive, I would say, and directly connected to leading to those jobs or many of those jobs landing here in the city. Your point I think goes to the fact that as a private sector company they're outsourcing a lot of their work. Um, what we can or cannot do about that is difficult to determine. I think you need to be careful with that. I'm happy to go and continue to fight for a higher percentage. Uh, many people would say the delivery problems are related to parts that are coming in from Mexico, but at the same point it's a good problem that we have 1,200 to 1,500 jobs here in the riding. 1,200 of which did not exist before. Thank you. Ms. Monteith Perra? The, uh, 
the problem at Bombardier when we speak to the workers uh, is definitely the outsourcing and the lack of control over supply delivery. And that's a private sector decision of that employer. How much you can regulate that is uh, by content, but also it's further than that, they're bringing in uh, their management team and from other countries. And I think we have to look at that. Um, we also need to, um, but government can only interfere so much in, in, in a private business. But I think if we work in consultation um, with the workers and with the employer and say this is unacceptable and that we need, you know, it's jeopardizing your contracts for the future, I believe that we could play a constructive role. Thank you. Mr. Postura? Uh, there have been concerns brought to me from a bar day. I've had a survey out that asked people if they felt that the local Member of Parliament, Provincial Parliament of Queen's Park should be advocating for places like Bombardier for contracts and the answer was overwhelmingly yes. This is absolutely something I actually agree with Bill Morrow on. I will absolutely advocate for projects and making sure that we have a seat at the table with the government is going to be a big part of that. There are concerns with a uh, lack of contracts. There's about a year coming September of contracts and after that there is quite a bit of uncertainty. So there's definitely going to be some work uh, to be done. We are going to have to have a seat at the table and make sure that contracts are being directed to jobs in Thunder Bay and make sure that we do get those contracts. It's very important and I look forward to having, having that opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Morrow, 30 seconds. In the mid-1990s, Mike Harris and the Conservatives announced they were no longer in the mass transit game. The City of Toronto stopped procuring vehicles. Our plant went down to two to 250 employees. 2003 election, we said we're back in the mass transit game. We start putting billions of dollars into mass transit. The city of Toronto starts procuring vehicles again. Our plant goes from 1,000 to 1,500 total employees. Probably the highest investment in a private sector employer, perhaps, since the war years that has ever occurred in the city of Thunder Bay. So if there's a problem there, it's a good one to have. Thank you, Mr. Morrow. Our next question is from Rosa, and the first response will be from Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce Vote Prosperity Platform calls for a standardization and reduction of the business education tax across the province. The NDP platform commits to harmonizing the business education tax, but instead of reducing the rate in areas where it is too high, proposes to raise the rate for those communities, like Thunder Bay, where the rate is lower than Toronto. In Thunder Bay, this increase would add thousands of dollars to property taxes for local businesses. How can you justify this tax increase on the hundreds of small businesses who work so hard to create jobs and opportunities for our city? In the platform, it also says that it will uh, standardize uh, the education tax, not the, yeah, the, not the education tax, the small business, small business tax. Anyway, it'll standardize the tax that you referred to. Um, but the other portion, the education tax, um, was going to be on a sliding scale. And, but small businesses are going to get a lot of advantages in our platform. They are going to uh, receive the benefit of a lower hydro rate. They're going to, we're going to maintain the reduction of the, uh, corp, uh, the small business tax rate. And uh, we will, you know, work with small businesses in a fair way, in a consultant way, and to make their, uh, because they are such an important uh, employer the largest employer of people in Ontario. Thank you. Mr. Posterman. Thank you for the question. I'm proud to, as most people know, be working with the PC party, which has announced that they will absolutely be uh, dropping the small business tax. It is something that's absolutely necessary. We do feel the crunch, and as a small business owner, I know that myself. One other thing that I'd just like to mention, this is an idea that I've been reading about. It's really interesting, and that's encouraging businesses that are kind of moving to the next level to scale up. So we do know about that, but large companies produce 46% of the GDP and we do need to find ways of possible, possibility of encouraging this scale of process, whether that's allowing taxation on corporate income growth or finding ways to overcome Ontario's scale up challenges. These are something that I'm absolutely going to be advocating for to help bring good paying jobs to the North. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Morrow. Ontario has the lowest unemployment rate that it has had in 17 years. Thunder Bay's unemployment rate is below the provincial average. We've seen over 800,000 net new, most of them full-time jobs, come into Ontario since the recession. 
we have a very, very strong economy. And, and one of the reasons we have that is because we've had an incredibly competitive, not the lowest corporate income tax rate. Uh, one of, certainly up until Donald Trump became president of the United States, far outstripping that which most United States, if not all of the states, had a very competitive CIT. And as well, we many years ago reduced the small business tax rate by about 22% from 4.5% to 3.5%. So we've done a lot of work to make small business and business generally in the province very competitive. One of the reasons why we have led North America in foreign direct investment is because we have in place a very competitive tax structure and we have nothing in our platform like about the billion dollar increase that is contained in the NDP budget. Ms. Monty Farrell, you have 30 seconds for further comments for that. We do have the, one of the lowest corporate tax rates, but that has not trickled down to everyone. We see the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor. And we see that when I go door to door and hear the stories. So that is a problematic. Small business can prosper with the, the low car, um, small business tax rate, which was what the question was. And growth and development is something that we have in our platform as well. Thank you. The next question will be from uh, Vic Krasowski, and the first response will be from Mr. Morrow. Oh, pardon me, Mr. Postuma. <laughs> Doug Ford has spoken about fixing hallway medicine in Ontario, and nowhere is hallway medicine more of an issue than here at the uh, Regional Health Sciences Centre, which is in gridlock quite a bit. Uh, what would a PC government under Doug Ford, how, how would they handle the overcrowding problems here? Thank you for the question. It's an excellent question. It's something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, I've been to the hospital, I've toured ER with the CEO there, we've uh, I've gotten a lot of information. Day one I can tell you I'm going to be meeting with the local health integration network. That's going to be something that I'm really excited to do. We do have unique needs in the north when it comes to healthcare, and I'm going to make sure those needs are met and brought to Queen's Park. Another thing our party has committed to is $3.8 billion for mental health and addiction services. We've also committed to 15,000 long-term care beds in the first 10 years with an additional 15,000 for a total of 30,000 long-term care beds. And this is really what we need up here. We need to get people out of the emergency room. We need to free up space. We are in 24-7 gridlock, as we all know. And the big thing for me is gonna to be to meet with the local frontline workers and the local doctors to make sure that their voices are heard at Queen's Park and that we can work together to get things going up here. Thank you, Mr. Morrow. The challenge with the hospital, and they will tell you this themselves, it's not my words, is not the number of beds that they have. They will tell you that. It is more about what is referred to as alternate level of care patients. Those are patients that do not need an acute care bed. They need a different care setting, a supportive housing unit or a long-term care bed. The frustration for me, and I would say as well for Michael Gravel, is we have brought significantly increased long-term care capacity to the city of Thunder Bay I would say in the order of 150 more long-term care beds, plus 132 supportive housing unit beds. But on those alternate level of care patients who are in the hospital, absolutely overcrowding the hospital, there is a shortage of PSWs that cannot be recruited, positions cannot be filled by St. Joseph's Care Group, and so we have permanent funded long-term care beds in the city that cannot be open to take those patients out of the hallway in the hospital. So it is a legitimate issue, it's very frustrating for all of us, but that is the nub of it. Ms. Monty Farrell. There was choices made by the last two governments to freeze, uh, freeze funding uh, to hospitals. And, uh, in, and in some cases, in the Conservatives' case, cut uh, uh, funding to hospitals. And what happened was that it created a, a crisis. What we need is stable funding, which uh, we have committed in our platform of a 5.3% increase with um, increases each year for stability. We have a crisis in long-term care as well. I went to a forum last night on long-term care and spoke with families and workers and administrators and that is in crisis as well. We've committed to more beds as every party has but we also need the strategy around personal support workers and making their lives at that job worth taking. Because for $16 an hour, that work is not attractive. And 30 seconds to Mr. Postuma for rebuttal. 
I would actually agree with Judith that PSWs are not happy, and I've heard that too, and they've been contacting me, letting me know that there are changes definitely that have to be made. But one, one small thing that I've come along this journey is there's, the North is different. There are different things we need here. One would be a detox center. And uh, when I've been working with the Salvation Army, they're actually working on this incredible life to, during the life process, a new building with the detox center. And I was really disappointed to hear that they were turned down for the NOHFC grant and they couldn't get the money from the province to build this new center. We need Thank you. Our next question is from Rosa Carlino and the first response will be from Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow, following the seven youth inquest, Anishinaabe Asking Nation Deputy Grand Chief Anna Betty, Betty Ashley Panishkam asked Thunder Bay City Council in June 2017 to increase its surveillance at locations considered high risk. Globally, the pre prevalence of surveillance cameras in urban settings has increased due to the advancement in the control center slash software technology, camera rec resolution, data analytics, and onward direction of artificial intelligence. These solutions offer real-time monitoring of public spaces and enhance the ability for emergency responders to be on scene quicker to respond to potentially dangerous or critical life-threatening incidents. To date, the City of Thunder Bay has been unable to find provincial funding opportunities for public safety infrastructure such as cameras and lighting. What would your party do to provide funding for needed community infrastructure to address public safety? Well, I'll start by saying that the level of financial support that has flowed to the City of Thunder Bay under our government is unprecedented. I will say that unequivocally and without hesitation. Number two, I'm not sure uh, if we have received a specific request provincially relative to what you've underscored in your question. I'm not aware of it that anybody has ever asked me to get funding for that. Number three, uh, what I would say to you is that for a number of years, and there's probably not a person in the room that's aware of this, we have been providing about $750,000 a year supporting the hiring many years ago of 13 police officers on the Thunder Bay City Police Department. One, a provincial conservative program, a ter terrific program from the late 90s that was the sunset. We made it permanent, subsidizing five officers at 50 a year. We brought in our own program, eight more officers hired, Northern Special Premium at 80,000 a year. So there is support that's been there historically on a specific request. I'm not sure I've received it. Ms. question. I, I'm not aware of the surveillance. I've heard about the surveillance, you know, on the riverfronts and requests for that. But I think the underlying problem is not um, the lack of police officers or the lack of surveillance. It's the poverty and despair and mental health, lack of mental health services that, and addiction services that we require in the city. And if we don't address those core issues, then really um, we're, we're just going to perpetuate. You can watch it all you want. You need to address the underlying issues of poverty and mental health in our community. Um, I would agree with Judith. This is a, a big issue, and there's always underlying issues. And unemployment is a huge driver for crime. It's a huge driver for mental illness. One of the things I'm strongly going to be focusing on is creating well-paying jobs. When people have well-paying jobs, they feel good about themselves. Um, they're doing things, they feel like they're part of the community. That is really important for me. I also really want to work with the Salvation Army to get that detox center built. They shouldn't be having little fundraisers to have to raise money. They should be able to partner with the province, get the funding they need, and have this incredible center, which should be such an asset to our community, built. We need to look at these opportunities. Uh, that, along with our commitment to me mental health and addiction services as a party overhaul all, is something I'm really excited to bring to our writing. Thank you. Thank you. The question was about infrastructure and providing money for physical equipment for the city, and I did my best to, to address that question. But um, I will agree with Judith. There are underlying issues that many municipalities are facing. I would say it's a national, international issue, addictions. Uh, mental health issues. Our government platform commits an additional $2.1 billion over the next four years to help build on the work that we've been doing historically, and I look forward to bringing that forward. Thank you. The next question is from Nick Krasowski, and the first response will be from Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell, uh, at the beginning, in your opening remarks, you spoke about your party's health care policy and uh, the prescription drug plan. 
how will you be able to ensure that there's quality control is at the same time keeping costs down with such a, a, an ambitious plan? The, uh, thanks for the question, and uh, the plan is going to be administered like through your OHIP card. So you will it will be reg you will be a registered uh, person in the system already, and you will have the ability to get buy your drugs. Quality control. If you buy, if those drugs will be bought by pharmacies <coughs> and, or the government in bulk, but they are the same drugs that are going to be use now and people paying a lot more for them. When you buy drugs in large quantities, uh, the ones that people use on a regular basis, diabetic drugs, uh, pain medication, whatever, um, you can realize a lot of savings. But they're the same drugs and from the same companies. Thank you. Mr. Postuma? I would agree with Judith on some of the points she's brought up. Another thing that we can do just for overall cost savings and efficiency is to have to work on having a better health board. So a health board that would actually bring different levels of government that are working on health and mental health issues, things like this, bring them together, create one board to avoid any overlap, any insufficiencies that are occurring and make sure that every level of government, every department is actually working together and over, you know, together as one health board. That would be really important to add to that. Thank you, Mr. Morrow. There are 4,400 drugs on the Ontario formulary. So directly to the question of it, it's nothing in that regard changes. We already have in place as a government, a program under 25, free. A real affordability issue for families with, with kids under 25 who may not have a benefit plan, who need access to medications. Our platform commits to an over 65 piece, where all 4,400 of those drugs in the formulary will be free. For most seniors it already is, but the deductible that they pay and the prescriptions every time they walk in the door would become free about a year from now. And there's also a piece in our platform that deals with drug and dental for the middle piece. 4,400 drugs in the formulary, already free for under 25, will be free for over 65 in the deduction, and a piece coming for the middle. But nothing changes in terms of what drugs become available through, through a plan. The long-term goal for us is a national pharma care plan. Well, it leaves that the plan that is uh, proposed by the Liberals that is a good start was a good start for those under 25, but it left a large number of people that cannot afford their medications, and we require um, medications to be available for everyone. So people shouldn't have to choose between food and their medicine. Thank you. Our next question is from Rosa, and the first response will be from Mr. Postula. Confederation College and Ontario's other colleges get less funding on a per-student basis than either universities or high schools. In fact, Ontario, Ontario's college are the lowest funded in Canada, even though they are critical to ensure that local communities can rely on strong, skilled workplace workforces. If elected, are you prepared to take steps to move college funding closer to the national average? Well, as a teacher and an educator, this is something I'm actually very passionate about. I know the difference that an education can make in someone's life, and like I said, skilled trades is something that's going to be absolutely pressed upon in the next coming years, and the answer is absolutely yes. I would be interested in bringing that to Queen's Park, and anything to do with jobs, anything to do with education, I will be a strong voice for the North at Queen's Park, and I look forward to the opportunity to have that. Thank you for the question. I think, I think most folks will know that we brought forward a free tuition for low income and many uh, middle income earners at college and university level. But to the question, I'm not sure that I agree with the premise of the question. The grant that goes to colleges is only part of the assistance from the government that goes to the college. If you compare only the grant uh, to other provinces who calculate these things differently, Ontario might be the lowest. But when you include the other assistance that flows to the students, that then flows through the student to the college, and you put that into the mix, I believe that Ontario lands somewhere in the middle when it comes to total direct financial assistance to the colleges uh, to support them in the work that they do. They've been a great partner for us here. We've been a great partner to them. 
We've supported them significantly with over $40 million in capital infrastructure as they're able to expand their programming and bring more students into the city. They're a big economic driver for us and they're a great partner. Thank you. Ms. Monteith Farrow. The, uh, the platform of the NDP absolutely uh, uh, addresses the need for the colleges to be funded properly because they provide that essential trades and technical advice and guidance and uh, education for our students. So, uh, yes, I guess is the answer that we would provide proper funding for the college. Thank you. Mr. Question, any further comments? I think we touched on most points. The only thing I would add is it's really important as a representative in Parliament or in uh, Queen's Park as a provincial politician to make sure that post secondary institutions like the college. Uh, make sure that their programs reflect changes in the labor market. The labor market is always changing. The business community in Ontario is always changing, and we do need to keep the regional and sectoral needs in Ontario's business community up to date and make sure that that's uh, something that we strongly represent. Thank you very much. The next question is from Vic Krasowski, and the first response will be from Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow, the Auditor General recently scolded the government over its accounting practices and how it relates to the deficit. As a cabinet minister, were you aware of the difference and do you support the auditor's findings? Well, we have had more than one uh, difference of opinion with the auditor general. And, but more to the point, so it does not sound partisan to anyone, uh, the auditor general herself has provided different opinions on the very same issue over different years, succeeding years, when it comes to how you account for pension surpluses on the government's books as one example. Uh, so having said that, the Auditor General is an independent officer of the legislature. We respect the work that they do. There are seven or eight independent officers. We do not always agree, and on this point, uh, clearly we've said unequivocally we do not agree. And not only that, there are a lot of private sector people who have provided opinions on the books, and they have validated the books. They believe they meet all accounting standards whatever that official language is for the Professional Accounting Institute, and they believe absolutely that the numbers are legitimate. Thank you. Ms. Monty Farrell. Thank you for that question. I, I was thinking about that, and uh, it's difficult. We had a mistake in our own platform, so I suppose uh, anything's possible. But uh, in our platform, we we refer to the fact that we need to work and listen to what the Auditor General says. In other budgets, or in other uh, statements and budgets, the Auditor General is there to inform us on where we could spend our money more wisely in the province, and we all agree that we should listen to those folks. In this case, it was a, a shortfall right before an election um, that like, seemed incorrect, like that the deficit was underestimated. Um, give everyone a benefit of the doubt, but uh, we should listen to the Auditor General and the recommendations they make. They make recommendations on departments, uh, on all sorts of things, so that's our position. Thank you. Mr. Posture. Uh Thank you. The Auditor General, uh, well obviously I love the Auditor General. As a PC member, we're all about accountability and honesty in the government. Uh, just bring a couple points. Auditor General looked at 14 government programs that recommended over $1 billion in savings with no layoffs just from those 14 programs. Um, they also talked about $1 billion in gas plant scandals, $9.2 billion overpaid for renewable energy contracts. These are things that a government has to keep in mind. We have to be honest, we have to be transparent, and we actually have to remember that taxpayers' dollars are hard-earned dollars. Thank you. Public accounts. That's a, a process that goes on every year, and it's good work. It's legitimate good work uh, by the province, uh, by the auditor. We don't always agree, but again, to the point, um, there are many people, I would say, including the auditor herself, who has not consistently uh, applied the same results to the same question. And so I would leave that with you. Um, we're very confident in the numbers that are there. They've been validated by a number of people. Thank you. And our final question is from Rosa, and the first response will be from Ms. Monty Farrell. The Standard & Poor's has said Ontario's credit rating is to be reduced due to debt and further deficits created by the recent budget. 
Since then, the parties have platforms that create larger deficits. How can you promise more spending and larger deficits in the face of Ontario credit rating being downgraded already? Thank you for the question. In our platform, we make it very clear that we are going to increase revenues and we are going to increase revenues to pay for the things in our platform. We're going to increase corporate tax rates uh, by a, a small margin and we are also going to make people who make over $220,000 a year and $330,000 a year pay a bit more and there's going to be a luxury car tax I mean and it's been costed out on on what that will cost but for those who can afford it they will be paying a little bit more and that you know you just can't cut and uh, expect to have the revenues to support the services in an aging population and with the problems we have in our healthcare system. You can pick cuts or you can pick healthcare. Thank you. Thank you. As we all know, the state of the province does not reflect well on the government. Uh, we do have to respect taxpayers' dollars. We do need to open Ontario for business, as we say. So this is something I'm absolutely passionate about. Um, it reflects on all of us and affects every single business. Um, one thing I'll just quickly mention is our customer service guarantee that all government applications in, will be approved in one year. We will have single wi window access for all approvals. And uh, right now, unfortunately, Ontario is not working well with businesses. We'll be cutting, cutting business tax rates. We'll be making it more affordable to run a business, whether it's hydro, union gas, or broadband expansion. And just to throw out there right now, we have double the regulations than any other province in the country. Nobody's opening a large-scale business is thinking of Ontario right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nora, I think Norad's getting pretty close to opening a large one. But thank you for, in your question, for including the fact that all parties are committed to, to running a deficit in their platform documents, absolutely. But what I would say to people, and it is an absolutely legitimate and a fair issue to discuss, the people that know me know that I describe myself as fiscally being conservative. It is a large debt, and there is a deficit in our budget. As in our platform, as there is in both of the other parties up here on the stage. The one thing I would say, and this doesn't diminish the challenge, in the early 1990s, Ontario was paying about 15 cents on every dollar of revenue to service the interest on the debt. Today, with the growth of the economy, we are paying 8 cents of every dollar of revenue to service interest on the debt. The aggregate is still large, but our capacity as a province to address that and carry it is legit. And if you're not interested in the deficit part, you have to ask what projects you wouldn't have wanted to come to Thunder Bay, like a couple of billion for Bombardier. Thank you. And 30 seconds to Ms. Monty Farrell for rebuttal. In our platform, we also have a, w a way of addressing the debt, and we look at paying down the debt. We agree that it is a, a concern for citizens and that we need to address it. So I invite people to look at the platform and how the debt would be addressed. Thank you very much. So that concludes the question period. So now we will move to our closing statements and we will do those in reverse order. So we'll be starting with Mr. Morrow. Well, thank you again, Charlotte, you and the Chamber. Thank you very much. Thank you to the other candidates for being here tonight. It's not easy to put your name forward and I want to congratulate both Judith and, and Brandon for doing exactly that. And thank you to all of you for being here uh, with us tonight. I'll just repeat some of what I said in my opening statement. It's been a great honor and a privilege to have been the member for Thunder Bay Atacokan for 15 years. I started off by saying I am not an ideologue. That's why I find myself with the party I'm with. I'm a pragmatist. I simply focus on achieving results for the residents and the communities that I've had the great honor and the great privilege to represent. As I said in my opening, the results are all around us. A thousand more jobs at Bombardier. Four-laning highways, and how long have people been asking for that? A northern platform commitment to four-lane from Manitoba to Quebec. A significant diversification in our economy that never existed before. Opportunities for young people to graduate with degrees, and 50% of people go to post-secondary now. When I came out of high school, it was about 25%. More people looking with good degrees who are looking for good jobs that want to stay in their home communities who now have a better opportunity to do that. If you're in a building trade union, 
you felt the impact of the work that we've done. If you work for an engineering firm and you're a young man working for an engineering firm, if you're a coal plant worker, if you work at Bombardier, if you're in construction, if you're in one of those diversified jobs, we have brought significant investment and job creation to this community, I would say possibly unprecedented in any other 15 year window of any government in Ontario's history. We are spending massive amounts, unprecedented amounts on Northern highways previous to our commitment on four-laning highways. So, for me, it's about results. I think the results are unequivocal. I take great pride in the work that we have been able to do as a government. On behalf of my colleague, Michael Grabell, and I thank you for the opportunity to have represented you over the last 15 years, and hopefully with your support on June 7th, I can continue to do that again. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know we've had a lot of issues here, like declining population, people having a hard time finding a well-paying job, but this is an opportunity for the North. PC government is forming the government in the next election. We need a seat at the table. For too long, a cloud of uncertainty has lingered over Northwestern Ontario. It's time for change. I know that if we're all willing to come together and work hard, we can make this the economic engine for the entire province. We need to take care of each other. We need to end hallway health care. We have to care for those in need, like our seniors and the less fortunate in our communities. But in order to do this, we have to have a strong economy. We, need, we do have many issues here, but most importantly, we have potential. My message is a message of hope. I see unearthed potential everywhere in Northwestern Ontario. We live in an area, like I've said, where everyone can have a well-paying job and a population that truly, and I mean truly, cares for each other. I will not sit here, I will not make false promises. I only make one promise, that I will be the hardest working politician this area has ever seen. I will be a strong voice for the North, and I will have a seat at the table for change. One thing I would like everyone to check out is our platform. We have an excellent platform. Just go to ontariopc.ca, go to People's Platform, or you can check out the Meet Brandon section at brandonposhima.ca. We also have a really important event coming up with Mr. Doug Ford coming to town. That's going to be on Friday, June 1st, 8 a.m. at the Valhalla Inn in the Lounge. Please come meet myself, come meet Doug Ford, ask us questions. I really look forward to seeing you there, and I look forward to working with everyone. Thank you very much for having me today. And two minutes to Ms. Monty Farrell. The Liberals are running on their experience and what they've done. And the problem is, is that we are living with some of the decisions and we are living with the consequences of that. We know that people are struggling. We know that people, that our hospital is in crisis and we know that there are people, 816 of them waiting for long-term care beds. The, uh, Conservatives have finally come out with a platform, I guess, but uh, the uh, too little, too late. Because what do you do with that? You don't have like we're, people have voted already, and they're now we're coming up with a platform. I think that that is, uh, and we know that the Doug Ford's cuts into Ontario. We've seen those, and what the impact of those is. You can't have those kinds of cuts and have the things that we need and expect in this province. So I encourage you on June 7th to look at our platform and look for someone in me who will speak for you, who will advocate for you, who understands the people of Northern Ontario, and I hope that you make the decision to vote NDP. Thank you. the Thunder Bay Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum. I think all these candidates deserve a great round of applause. They've done an amazing job. Thank you for being here. Special thanks also to our panelists, Rosa Carlino and Dick Krasowski. Great job. And I'd like to thank our media supporters, Acadia Broadcasting and Net News Ledger. The entire forum will be available on netnewsledger.com. And it will also be available on both the Shaw Cable and T Baytel neighborhood channels, so check that out. Our thanks to our host, the Da Vinci Center, and to Maverick Entertainment Group for their help with the AV services, and to each of you for being here tonight.
We hope that the discussion has been helpful to you as you make your voting decision. Get out there and vote. Enjoy your evening. Thank you very much.